Act 2. Scene as before. Brilliant morning light. Christy, looking bright and cheerful, is cleaning a girl's boot. Christy, to himself, counting jugs on dresser. Half a hundred beyond. Ten there, score that's above. Eighty jugs, six cups and a broken one. Two plates. Bottles of school must be hard set to count and enough in them. I'm thinking to drunken all the wealth and wisdom in the county, Claire. He puts down the boot carefully. There's her boots now. Nice and decent for her evening use. And isn't it grand brushes she has? He puts them down and goes by degrees to the looking glass. Well, this would be a fine place to be my whole life, talking out with swearing Christians in place of my old dogs and cats. And I stalking around, smoking my pipe and drinking my fill. And never a day's work but drawing a cork in odd time or wiping a glass or rinsing out a shiny tumbler for a decent man. He takes the looking glass from the wall and puts it on the back of a chair, then sits down in front of it and begins washing his face. Didn't I know rightly I was handsome? Though it was the devil's own mirror we had beyond, would twist a squint across an angel's brow and I'll be grown fine from this day. The way I'll have a soft, lovely skin on me and won't be the like of the clumsy young fellows do be plowing all times in the earth and dung. He starts. Is she coming again? He looks out. Stranger girls. God help me, where I'll hide myself away in my long neck naked to the world. He looks out. I'd best go to the room maybe till I'm dressed again. He gathers up his cloak and the looking glass and runs into the inner room. The door is pushed open and Susan Brady looks in and knocks on door. Susan. There's nobody in it. Knocks again. Nellie, pushing her in and following her with Honor Blake and Sarah Tansy. It'd be early for them both to be out walking the hill. Susan, I'm thinking Sean Keel was made game of us, and there's no such man in it at all. Honor, pointing at a straw and quilt. Look at that. He's been sleeping here in the night. Well, it'll be hard case if he's gone off now. The way we'll never set eyes on a man who killed his father, and we after rising early and destroying ourselves running fast on the hill. Nellie, are you thinking them's his boots? Sarah, taking them up. If they are, there should be his father's tracks on them. Did you never read in the papers the way murdered men do bleed and drip? Susan. Is that blood there, Sarah Tansy? Sarah, smelling it. That's bog water, I'm thinking. But it's his own they are, surely. For I've never seen the like of them for whitey mud and red mud and turf on them, and the fine sands of the sea. That man's been walking, I'm telling you. She goes down right, putting out one of his boots. Susan, going to window. Maybe he's stolen off to Belmont with the boots of Michael James. And you'd have a right to follow after him, Sarah Tansy. And you, the one yoked the ass cart and drove ten miles to set your eyes on a man bit the yellow lady's nostril on the northern shore. She looks out. Sarah, rushing to window, with one boot on. Don't be talking, and we fooled today. Putting on another boot. There's a pair that do fit me well. And I'll be keeping them for walking to the priest, when you'd be ashamed this place going up winter and summer with nothing worthwhile to confess at all. Honor, who has been listening at inner door. Whist! There's someone inside the room. It's a man. Sarah kicks off boots and puts them where they were. They all stand in a line looking through chink. Sarah. I'll call him. Mister. Mister. Is Pegeen with you? Christy, coming in as meek as a mouse, with the looking glass held behind his back. She's above in the canoe scene. Sick in the nanny goats the way she'd have a sup of goat's milk for to color my tea. Sarah. And asking your pardon, is it you the man killed his father? Christy, sidling towards the nail where the glass was hanging. I am, God help me. Sarah, taking eggs she has brought. Then my thousand welcomes to you. And I've run up with a brace of duck's eggs for your food today. Pegeen's ducks is no use, but these are real rich sort. Hold out your hand, and you'll see it's no lie I'm telling you. Christy, coming forward shyly, and holding out his left hand. They're great and weighty size. Susan, and I run up with a pat of butter, for it'll be a poor thing to have you eaten your spuds dry, and you have to run in a great way since you did destroy your da. Christy, thank you kindly. Honor, and I brought you a little cut of cake, for you should have a thin stomach on you, and you that length walk in the world. Nellie, and I brought you a little laying pullet, boiled and all she is was crushed at full night by the curate's car. Feel the fat of that breast, mister. Christy, it's bursting, surely. He feels it with the back of his left hand, in which he holds the presence. Sarah, will you pinch it? 
Is your right hand too sacred for us to use at all? She slips round behind him. It's a looking glass he has. Well, I've never seen to this day a man with a looking glass held to his back. Them that kills their fathers is a vain lot, surely. <laughs> Girls giggle. Christy, smiling innocently and piling presents on glass. <laughs> I- I'm very thankful to you all today. Widow Quinn, coming in quickly, at door. Sarah Tansy, Susan Brady, Honor Blake. What in glory has you here at this hour of day? Girls giggling. <laughs> That's the man killed his father. Widow Quinn, coming to them. I know well it's the man. And I'm after putting him down in the sports below for race and leppin' pitchin' and the Lord knows what. Sarah, exuberantly. That's right, Widow Quinn. I'd bet my dowry he'd lick the world. If he will, he'd have a right to have him fresh and nourished in place of nursing a feast. Taking presents. Are you fasting or fed, young fellow? Christy. <laughs> fasting, if you please. Widow Quinn, loudly. Well, you're the lot. Stir up now and give him his breakfast. To Christy. Come here to me. She puts him on bench beside her while the girls make tea and get his breakfast. And let you tell us your story before Begin will come, in place of grinning your ears off like the moon in May. Christy, beginning to be pleased. It's a long story you'd be destroyed listening. Don't be letting on to be shy. A fine, gamey, treacherous lad the like of you. Was it in your house beyond you cracked his skull? Christy, shy but flattered. <laughs> it was not. We were digging spuds in his cold, sloping, stony devil's patch of a field. Widow Quinn. And you went asking money of him? Or making talk of getting a wife would drive him from his farm? I did not then. But there I was, digging and digging, and... You squintin' idiot, says he. Let you walk down now and tell the priest you'll wed the widow Casey in a score of days. Widow Quinn. And what kind was she? Christy, with horror. A walking terror from beyond the hills. And she two score in five years, and two hundred weights and five pounds in the weighing scales, with a limping leg on her and a blinded eye, and she a woman of noted misbehavior with the old and young. He begins gnawing at chicken leg. Girls clustering round him, serving him. Glory be! Widow Quinn. And what did he want driving you to wed with her? She takes a bit of the chicken. Christy, eating with growing satisfaction. He was letting on I was wanting a protector from the harshness of the world. And he, without a thought the whole while, but how he'd have her hut to live in and her gold to drink. Widow Quinn. It's maybe worse than a dry hearth and a widow woman in your glass at night. So you hit him then? I did not. I won't wet her, says I, when all I know she did suckle me for six weeks when I came into the world, and she a hag this day with a tongue in her has the crows and seabirds scattered, the way they wouldn't cast a shadow in her garden with a dread of her curse. Widow Quinn, teasingly. That one should be right company. Sarah, eagerly, don't mind her. Did you kill him then? Christy, she's too good for the like of you, says he, and go on now or I'll flatten you out like a crawling beast has passed under a dray. You will not if I can help it, says I. Go on, says he, or I'll have the devil making garters of your limbs tonight. You will not if I can help it, says I. He sits bolt up, brandishing his mug. Sarah, you were right, surely. Christy, impressively. With that the sun came up between the cloud and the hill, and it shining green in my face. God have mercy on your soul, says he, lifting his scythe. All are on your own, says I, raising the loy. Susan. That's a grand story. Honor. He tells it lovely. Christy. Flattered and confident, waving bone. He gave me a drive with the scythe, and I took a lep to the east. Then I turned round with my back to the north, and I had a blow on the ridge of his skull, laid him stretched out, and he split to the knob of his gullet. He raises the chicken bone to his Adam's apple. Girls together. Well, you're a marvel. Oh, God bless you. You're the lad, Shirley. Susan. I'm thinking the Lord God sent him this road to make a second husband to the widow queen, and she a great yearning to be wedded, though all dread her here. Lift him on her knee, Sarah Tansy. Don't tease him. Sarah, going over to dress her and counter very quickly, and getting two glasses and porter. Your hero, Shirley, and let you drink a supping with your arms linked like the outlandish lovers in the sailor's songs. She links their arms and gives them glasses. There now, drink a health to the wonders of the western world, the pirates, preachers, poteen makers and the jobbing jockeys, parching peelers and the juries fill their stomachs selling judgments of the English law. Brandishing the bottle. Widow Quinn. That's a right toast, Sarah Tansy. Now, Christy. They drink with their arms linked. He drinking with his left hand, she with her right. As they are drinking, 
Peggy and Mike comes in with a milk can and stands aghast. They all spring away from Christy. He goes down left. Widow Quinn remains seated. Peggy, angrily, to Sarah. What is it you're wanting? Sarah, twisting her apron. An ounce of tobacco? Peggy, have you tuppence? I- I've forgotten my purse. Peggy, then you'd best be getting it and not fooling us here. To the Widow Quinn, with more elaborate scorn. And what is it you're wanting, Widow Quinn? Widow Quinn, insolently. A pen's worth of starch. Peggy, breaking out. And you without a white shift or a shirt in your whole family since the drying of the flood? <laughs> I've no starch for the like of you, and let you walk on now to kill a muck. Widow Quinn, turning to Christy as she goes out with the girls. Well, you're mighty huffy this day, Peggy and Mike. And you, young fellow, let you not forget the sports and racing when the noon is by. They go out. Peggy, imperiously, fling out that rubbish and put them cups away. Christy tidies away in a great haste. Shove in the bench by the wall. He does so. And hang that glass on the nail. What disturbed it at all? Christy, very meekly. I was making myself decent only. And this a fine country for young, lovely girls. Peggy, sharply. Wist you're talking of girls. Wouldn't any wish to be decent in a place? Wist I'm saying. Christy looks at her face for a moment with great misgivings. Then, as a last effort, takes up a loy and goes towards her with feigned assurance. It was with a loy the like of that I killed my father. Peggy, still sharply. You've told me that story six times since the dawn of day. It's a queer thing you wouldn't care to be hearing it. And them girls after walking four miles to be listening to me now. Four miles? Christy, apologetically. Didn't himself say there were only bona fides living in the place? Peggy, it's bona fides by the road they are, but that lot came over the river lepping the stones. It's not three perches when you go like that, and I was down this morning looking on the papers the postboy does have in his bag with meaning and emphasis, for there was great news this day, Christopher Mahone. She goes into room left. Christy, suspiciously. Is it any news of my murder? Peggy, inside. Murder indeed! Christy, loudly. A murder, da? Peggy, coming in again and crossing right. There was not, but a story filled half a page of a hanging of a man. And that should be a fearful end, young fellow, and it worst of all for a man destroyed as da. For the like of him would get small mercies, and when it's dead he is, they'd put him in a narrow grave with cheap sacking wrapping cloth around him, and pour down quick lime on his head, the way you'd see a woman pouring any fish frash from a cup. Christy, very miserably. Oh, God help me. Are you thinking I'm safe? You were saying at the fall of night I was shut of jeopardy and I here with yourselves. Peggy, severely. You'll be shut of jeopardy no place if you go talking with a pack of wild girls the like of them do be walking around with the peelers talking whispers at the fall of night. Christy, with terror. And you're thinking they'd tell? Peggy, with mock sympathy. Who knows, God help you? Christy, loudly. What joy would they have to be bringing hanging to the likes of me? Peggy, it's queer joy as they have. And who knows the thing they'd do, if it'd make the green stones cry itself to think you're swaying and swiggling at the butt of the rope, and you with a fine stout neck, God bless you, the way you'd be half an hour in great anguish getting your death. Christy, getting his boots and putting them on. If there's that terror in them, it'd be best, maybe. I went on wandering like Esau or Cain and Abel on the sides of Nephin or the Eris Plain. Peggy beginning to play with him. It would, maybe. For I've heard the circuit judges this place as a heartless crew. Christy, bitterly. It's more than judges this place as a heartless crew. Looking up at her. And isn't it a poor thing to be starting out again? And I, a lonesome fellow, be looking out on women and girls the way the needy fallen spirits do be looking on the Lord. What call of you to be that lonesome when there's poor girls walking mayo in their thousands now? Christy, grimly. It's well you know what call I have. It's well you know it's a lonesome thing to be passing small towns with the light shining sideways when the night is down or going in strange places and a dog nosing before you and a dog nosing behind. Or drawn to the cities where you'd hear a voice kissing and talking deep love in every shadow of the ditch and you passing on with an empty hungry stomach failing from your heart. Peggy, I'm thinking you're an odd man, Christy Mahone. The oddest walking fellow I ever set my eyes on till this hour of day. Christy, what would any be but odd men and they live in lonesome in the world? Peggy, I'm not odd, and I'm my whole life living with my father only. Christy, with infinite admiration. 
How would a lovely, handsome woman the like of you be lonesome when all men should be thronging around to hear the sweetness of your voice? And the little infant children should be pestering your steps, I'm thinking, and you walk in the roads. Pegine. I'm hard set to know what way a coaxing fellow the like of you yourself should be lonesome either. Coaxing? Would you have me think a man never talked with the girls would have the words you've spoken today? It's only letting on you are to be lonesome, the way you'd get around me now. I wish to God I was letting on. But I was lonesome all times, and born lonesome I'm taking as the moon of dawn. Goes to door. Pegine, puzzled by his talk. Well, it's a story I'm not understanding at all why you'd be worse than another, Christy Mahon. And you a fine lad with the great savagery to destroy your da. It's a little I'm understanding myself, saving only that my heart's scalded this day. And I going off stretching out the earth between us, the way I'll not be looking near you another dawn of the year till the two of us do arise to hope or judgment with the saints of God. And now I best be going with my wattle in my hand. The hanging is a poor thing, turning to go, and it's little welcome only is left for me in this house today. Pegine, sharply. Christy! He turns round. Come here to me. He goes towards her. Lay down that switch and throw some sods on the fire. You had a pot boy in this place, and I'll not have you mitch off from us now. Christy. He was saying I'd be hanged if I stay. Pegine, quite kindly at last. I'm after going down and reading the fearful crimes of Ireland for two weeks or three, and there wasn't a word of your murder. Getting up and going over to the counter. They've likely not found the body. You're safe so with ourselves. Christy, astonished, slowly. It's making game of me you were. Following her with fearful joy. And I can stay so, working at your side and I not lonesome from this mortal day. What's to hinder you staying? Except the widow woman or the young girls would inveigle you off. Christy, with rapture. <laughs> and I'll have your words from this day filling my ears. And that look has come upon your meeting my two eyes. And I watching you loafing around in the warm sun. Pegine, kindly, but a little embarrassed. I'm thinking you'll be a loyal young lad to have working around. And if you've vexed me a while since you're leaguing with the girls, I wouldn't give a thrunning for a lad had into mighty spirit in him and a gamey heart. Sean Keel runs in carrying a cleave on his back, followed by the widow Quinn. Sean, to begin. I was passing below and I seen your mountainy sheep eating cabbages in Jimmy's field. Run up while they'll be bursting, surely. Pegine. Oh, God, mend em. She puts a shawl over her head and runs out. Christy, looking from one to another, still in high spirits. I'd best go to her aid, maybe. I'm handy with yous. Widow Quinn, closing the door. She can do that much. And there Shanine has long speeches for to tell you now. She sits down with an amused smile. Sean, taking something from his pocket and offering it to Christy. Do you see that, mister? Christy, looking at it. The half of a ticket to the Western States. Sean, trembling with anxiety. I'll give it to you, and my new hat. Pulling it out of hamper. And my breeches with the double seat. Pulling it out. And my new coat is woven from the blackest shearings for three miles round. Giving him the coat. I give you the whole of them and my blessings and the blessings of Father Riley itself, maybe, if you'll quit from this and leave us in the peace we had till last night at the fall of dark. Christy, with new arrogance. And for what is it you're wanting to get shut of me? Sean, looking at the widow for help. I'm a poor scholar with middling faculties to coin a lie. So I'll tell you the truth, Christy Mahone. I'm wedding with Pegine beyond, and I don't think well of having a clever, fearless man the like of you dwelling in her house. Christy, almost pugnaciously. <laughs> and you'd be using bribery for to banish me? Sean, in an imploring voice. Let you not take it badly, Mr. Honey. Isn't beyond the best place for you where you'll have golden chains and shiny coats and you riding upon hunters with the ladies of the land? He makes an eager sign to the Widow Quinn to come and help him. Widow Quinn coming over. It's true for him. And you'd best quit off and not have that poor girl setting her mind on you. For there Shanine thinks she wouldn't suit you though it's all saying she's wed to you now. Christy beams with delight. Sean, in terrified earnestness. She wouldn't suit you. And she with the devil's own temper the way you'd be strangling one another in a score of days. He makes the movement of strangling with his hands. It's the like of me only that she's fit for. A quiet, simple fellow wouldn't raise a hand upon her if she scratched itself. 
Widow Quinn, putting Sean's hat on Christy. Fit them clothes on you anyhow, young fellow, and he'd maybe loan them to you for the sports. Pushing him towards inner door. Fit them on, and you can give your answer when you have them tried. Christy, beaming, delighted with the clothes. I will, then. I'd like herself to see me in them tweeds and hats. He goes into room and shuts the door. Sean, in great anxiety. He'd like herself to see them. He'll not leave us, Widow Quinn. He's a score of devils in him the way it's well nigh certain he will wed Pegeen. Widow Quinn, jeeringly. It's true all girls are fond of courage and do hate the like of you. Sean, walking about in desperation. Oh, Widow Quinn, what'll I be doing now? If I wasn't so God-fearing, I near had the courage to come behind him and run a pike into his side. Oh, it's a hard case to be an orphan and not to have your father that you're used to. And you'd easy kill make yourself a hero in the sight of all. Coming up to her. Oh, Widow Quinn, will you find me some contrivance when I've promised you and you? Widow Quinn. At you is a small thing. But what would you give me if I did wed him and save you so? Sean, with astonishment. You? Widow Quinn. I. Would you give me the red cow you have in the mountaineer ram, and the right of way across your riot path, and a load of dung at Michaelmas, and turbury upon the western hill? Sean, radiant with hope. I would, surely. And I'd give you the wedding ring I have, and the loan of the new suit the way you'd have him decent on the wedding day. I'd give you two kids for your dinner and a gallon of poteen, and I'll call the piper on the long cart to your wedding from Crossmalina or from Balina. I'll give you... Widow Quinn, that'll do. So, let you wist. But he's coming now again. Christy comes in very natty in the new clothes. Widow Quinn comes to him admiringly. Widow Quinn, if you've seen yourself now, I'm thinking you'd be too proud to speak to us at all, and it'd be a pity surely to have you like sailing from Mayo to the Western world. Christy, as proud as a peacock, I'm not going. If this is a poor place itself, I'll make myself contented to be lodging here. Widow Quinn makes a sign to Sean to leave them. Sean, well... I'm going measuring the race course while the tide is low, so I'll leave you to the garments and my blessing for the sports today. God bless you. He wriggles out. Widow Quinn, admiring Christy. Well, you're a mighty spruce young fellow. Sit down now while you're quiet till you talk with me. Christy, swaggering. I'm going abroad on the hillside for to seek Pegeen. You'll have great time and plenty for to seek Pegeen. And you heard me saying at the fall of night the two of us should be great company. From this out, I'll have no want of company when all sorts is bringing me their food and clothing. He swaggers to the door, tightening his belt. The way they'd set their eyes upon a gallant orphan cleft his father with one blow to the breech's belt. He opens door, then staggers back. Saints of glory. Holy angels from the throne of light. Widow Quinn, going over. What ails you? It's the walking spirit of my murdered da. Widow Quinn, looking out. Is it that tramper? Christy, wildly. Where will I hide my poor body from that ghost of hell? The door is pushed open, and Old Mahone appears on threshold. Christy darts in behind door. Widow Quinn, in great amusement. God save you, my poor man. Mahone, gruffly. Did you see a young lad passing this way in the early morning of the fall of night? Widow Quinn. He had a queer kind to walk in and not salute at all. Did you see the young lad? Widow Quinn, stiffly. What kind was he? An ugly young strailer with a mysterious gob on him, and a little switch in his hand. I met a tramper seen him coming this way at the fall of night. Widow Quinn. There's harvest hundreds do be passing these days from this sligo boat. What is it you're wanting from him, my poor man? I want to destroy him for breaking the head on me with the clout of a loy. He takes off a big hat and shows his head in a mass of bandages and plaster with some pride. It was he did that. And am I a great wonder to think I've traced him ten days with that rent in my crown? Widow Quinn, taking his head in both hands and examining with extreme delight. That was a great blow. And who hit you? A robber, maybe? Mahone. It was my own son hit me. And he the devil a robber any else but a dirty, scuttering lout. Widow Quinn, letting go his skull and wiping her hands on her apron. You'd best be wary of a mortified scalp, I think they call it. Lepping around with that wound in the splendor of the sun. It was a bad blow, surely. And you should have vexed him fearful to make him strike that gash on his da. Is it me? Aye. And isn't it a great shame when the old and hardened do torment the young? Mahone, raging. Torment him, is it? 
and I have to hold not with the patience of a martyred saint till there's nothing but destruction on me and I'm driven out to my old age with none to aid me. Widow Quinn, greatly amused. It's a sacred wonder the way wickedness will spoil a man. <laughs> my wickedness is it. Am I after saying it's himself as me destroyed? And here a liar on walks, a talker of folly, a man you'd see stretched half the day in the brown ferns with his belly to the sun. Not working at all? The devil work. Or if he did it self, you'd see him raising up a haystack like the stock of a rush, or driving our last cow till he broke our leg at the hip, and when he wasn't at that, he'd be fooling over the little birds he had, finches and felts and making mugs at his own self and the bit of glass he had hung on the wall. Widow Quinn, looking at Christy. What way was he so foolish? It was running wild after the girls, maybe? Mahone, with a shot of derision. Ha! <laughs> running wild, is it? If he seen a red petticoat come and swinging over the hill, he'd be off to hide in the sticks, and you'd see him shooting out his sheep's eyes between the little twigs and leaves, and his two ears rising like a hare looking through the gap. Girls, indeed. It was drink, maybe. And your poor fellow would get drunk on the smell of a pint. He's a queer, rotten stomach, I'm telling you. And when I gave him three pulls from my pipe a while since, he was taken with contortions till I had to send him in the ass cart to the female's nurse. Widow Quinn, clasping her hands. Well, I never till this day heard tell of man the like of that. I'd take a mighty oath you didn't, surely. And wasn't he laughing joke of every female woman where four baronies meet? The way the girls would stop their weeding if they could see him come in the road to let a roar at him and call him the loony of Mahons. I'd give the world and all to see the like of him. What kind was he? A small, low fellow. And dark? Dark and dirty. Widow Quinn, considering. I'm thinking I seen him. Mahone, eagerly. An ugly young blackguard. A hideous, fearful villain in the spit of you. What way has he fled? Gone over the hills to catch a coasting streamer to the north or south. Can I pull up on him now? If you'll cross the sands below where the tide is out, you'll be in as soon as himself. For he had to go around ten miles at the top of the bay. She points from the door. Strike down by the head beyond and then follow on the roadway to the north and east. Mahone goes abruptly. Widow Quinn, shouting after him. Let you give him a good vengeance when you come upon him. But don't put yourself in the power of the law. For it'll be a poor thing to see a judge in his black cap reading out his sentence on a civil warrior the like of you. She swings the door to and looks at Christy, who is cowering in terror. Then she bursts into a laugh. <laughs> well, you're the walking playboy of the western world. And that's the poor man you had divided to his breeches belt. Christy, looking out, then to her. What'll Pegeen say when she hears that story? What'll she be saying to me now? Widow Quinn. She'll knock the head of you, I'm thinking. And drive you from the door. God help her to be taking you for a wonder. And you a little schemer making up a story you destroyed, Dada. Christy, turning to the door, nearly speechless with rage, half to himself. To be letting on he was dead and coming back to his life and following me like an old weasel tracing a rat, and coming in here laying desolation between myself and the fine woman of Ireland, and he a kind of carcass that you'd fling upon the sea. Widow Quinn, more soberly, there's talking for a man's one and only son. Christy, breaking out, his one son, is it? May I meet him with one tooth in a taken, and one eye to be seen, seven and seventy devils in the twist of the road, and one old timber leg on him to limp into the scalding grave? Looking out, there he is now crossing the strands, and that the Lord God would send a high wave to wash him from the world. Widow Quinn, scandalized. Have you no shame? Putting her hand on his shoulder and turning him round. What ails you? You're crying, is it? Christy, in despair and grief. Am I after seeing the love and light of the star of knowledge shine from her brow, and hearing words would put you thinking on the holy bridge and speaking to the infant saints? And now she'll be turning again and speaking hard words to me like an old woman with a spam in the ass she'd have urging on a hill. Widow Quinn. There's poetry talk for a girl you'd see itching and scratching, and she with a stale stink of poteen on her from selling in the shop. Christy, impatiently. It's her like is fitted to be handling merchandise in the heavens above. And what'll I be doing now, I ask you, and I kind of wonder was jilted by the heavens when a day was by. There is a distant noise of girls' voices. Widow Quinn looks from window and comes to him hurriedly. Widow Quinn, 
You'll be doing the like of myself, I'm thinking. When I did destroy my man for him, above many of the days, odd times and great spirits, abroad in the sunshine, darning a stocking, a stitching a shift, and odd times again looking out into the schooners or hookers, trawlers is sailing the sea, and I'm thinking on the gallant hairy fellows are drifting beyond, and myself long years living alone. Christy, interested. You're like me, so. Widow Quinn, I am your like. And as for that, I'm taking a fancy to you. And I with my little house seen above where there be myself to tend you. And none to ask where you a murderer or what at all. Christy, and what would I be doing if I left Pegine? I have nice jobs you could be doing. Gathering shells to make a whitewash for a hut within. Building up a little goose house or stretching a new skin on an old Keurig I have. And if my hut is far from all sides, it's there you'll meet the wisest old men, I tell you, at the corner of my wheel. And it's there yourself and me will have great times whispering and hugging. Voices outside, calling far away. Christy! Christy Bahan! Christy! Christy, is it Piggy and Mike? Widow Quinn, it's the young girls, I'm thinking, coming to bring you to the sports below. And what does it you'll have me tell them now? Christy, aid me for to win Piggy. It's herself only I'm seeking now. Widow Quinn gets up and goes to window. Aid me for to win her, and I'll be asking God to stretch a hand to you in the hour of death, and lead you shortcuts through the meadows of ease, and up the floor of heaven in the footstool of the virgin sun. Widow Quinn. <laughs> There's praying. Voices nearer. Christy! Christy Mahone! Christy with agitation. They're coming. Will you swear to aid to save me for the love of Christ? Widow Quinn looks at him for a moment. If I aid you, will you swear to give me a right of way I want? and a mountainy ram and a load of dung at Michaelmas, the time that you'll be master here? Christy, I will, by the elements and stars of night. Widow Quinn, then will not say a word of the old fellow, the way Pekin won't know your story till the end of time. Christy, and if he chances to return again? Widow Quinn, will swear he's a maniac and not your da. I can take an oath I'd see him raving on the sands today. Girls run in. Susan, Come out to the sports below. Pegine says you're to come. Sarah Tansy. The leppings begin. And we've a jockey suit to fit you up for the mule race on the sands below. Honor. Come on, will you? Christy. <laughs> I will then if Pegine's beyond. Sarah. She's in the boring making game of Shanine Keel. Christy. <laughs> then I'll be going to her now. He runs out, followed by the girls. Widow Quinn. Well, if the worst comes in the end of all. It'll be great game to see there's none to pity him but a widow woman the like of me has buried her children and destroyed her man. She goes out. Curtain.